It's a great pleasure uh, to launch this book, more than you wanted to know about John Baldessari. Today I'm incredibly grateful, of course, to John uh, for this amazing process uh, of uh, weekly conversations over many, many years. We're not sure with Meg how long it took. Uh, we think somewhere between five and seven years. It's always a very lengthy process in an interesting way to edit artists' writings. I've done it before with Gerhard Richter and Louis Bourgeois and uh, Leon Golub, uh, also uh, Maria Lasnik, uh, Gilbert and George. And it's something which usually always takes a long time because there one keeps discovering more and more writings. And uh, I'm, of course, uh, deeply grateful to Mac for this wonderful process. Uh, no one uh, knows more about you know, John's writings than Mac, and Mac kept discovering uh, new treasures, and we, uh, almost until a week before the book went to print, found, found new text. And we, of course, are very grateful to our publisher, Lionel Bovier, who is here with us today, uh, uh, who uh, published these two volumes, more than you wanted to know about uh, John Balesari, both Meg and I will tell you more about the book, but before that, we're going to watch this film, and I now hand over to Meg, who will introduce the, the film. Uh, thank you. So, um, I'm Meg Cranston, and I'm the co-editor of the book. Um, <clears throat> so, John was not able to come today, and uh, so we decided, uh, he decided actually, uh, instead he would make this uh, video, which we're, you're seeing for the first time, you're the first audience to see this, uh, and he discusses his, uh, his artwork and the, his history of writing, which goes back pretty far, um, as he'll say in the video, uh, perhaps not directly, but he has said many times to Hans Ulrich and I that he thinks of himself as a writer. And part of the idea of the, of the book was to, to kind of explore that idea. If John thinks of himself as a writer, could we present a book that is a, presented as a literary work? So um, when you uh, get your book after this, we hope you get your book after this, you'll see that there are no illustrations in the book. Uh, so the, the writing rises or falls on its own, on its own merits. But uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. We'll go ahead and, and, and hear what John has to say about his writing. Oh, and the film was made by Felipe Lima. John, do you have a phone on you? Can you turn your phone off? Yeah, they're off as far as I can see. Yeah, okay, good. The book is all things that are written from the mid-60s to up in the 70s or so. Mostly notes to myself, but a lot of times communication with other people or to students. Hans Ulrich had the idea of doing the book. I suggested a, uh, a good friend of mine, Meg Scranson, to do the editing of it. Two volumes, and it's called More Than You Want to Know About John Baldessari. When I was thinking about the title, I really said it in jest. Uh, and I think it was a response to too many books of writings about artists. You know, I was just kind of feeling sorry for people. And I, you know, I said I want, should warn them in advance. <laughs> Why didn't I become a writer? Um, I, I think the closest I got to it was that when I got my undergraduate degree, I went on to do graduate work at Berkeley and art, and I chose art history rather than art practice because I felt kind of embarrassed to tell people I was an artist, and I thought it was you know easier to say, well, I'm an art historian. I didn't think I was particularly good at writing about art, in, at least in the way it was written about in that time. I decided I wasn't going to be a very good art historian, but I always had a fondness for writing in the written word. I think in probably the mid-60s, I started using language in my work. I was kind of painting uh, at the mode of the time, which was kind of abstract expressionist, and people's complaint was that they couldn't understand that their kids could do that, blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, why not do what people, uh, how, how they normally communicate, you know, re reading or looking at pictures in magazines or newspapers. So I, I did that, you know, started using this text or text and photographic image. And of course that didn't work either, uh, but I, you know, I gave it a shot. 
people are taught to be verbally uh, uh, proficient and they don't they're really not train how to read things visually. But the good thing about imagery is that people see something and they jump to conclusions. And I kind of like that. <laughs> there were other artists using language at the time. I guess they were the early conceptual artists. So I guess there was something in the air. And I think what was in the air was, you know, just that dissatisfaction with painting uh, that it might have run its course and there might be another way to do art. When I emerged as an artist, uh, it seems like the line in the sand, in New York anyway, you know, where I was hanging out a lot, was between painters and those other guys, and those other guys included me, but uh, conceptual art, minimal art, pop art, and the main job was to seem to shed stuff, get rid of stuff, and, and, and down to sort of basic ideas and rebuild again. And I guess that just stayed with me. And there's something in me that always wants to kind of cut to the chase uh, and, 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 and be as direct as possible. And I always think about somebody alone on a desert island and an airplane coming over and, and they're going to write help very simply. You know, they're not going to have, you know, Sarah's on it and decorative H and so on. You know, this is going to be help. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, pre I prefer just saying what's on your mind. I don't think I would ever say edifice instead of house. Any writing I do is meant to be clear. It's not meant to be exotic or ornamental. Writing helped me understand what I was thinking about. It's an interesting experiment. I'm interested in minimalism, you know, just strip things away and, okay, let's see how he sounds without imagery. What drives an interest in artist's writings I remember a pretty well-known critic said to me that anybody that believes what an artist has to say about their work is a damn fool. So I think I was trying to counteract that. I'm always more interested in what an artist has to say about their work. I love Lisk. I mean, there's no adornment of language. If you need some mustard, you don't say, I really want a delicious mustard. It's just pretty straightforward. <laughs> and, I, and I like that. It's just, you know, you know cut to the facts. Uh, teaching to tell arts, it was completely different. Uh, our motto used to be, no information in advance of need. Uh, and uh, so we didn't, we didn't know what artists needed until they told us what they needed. Uh, and actually, if a person had just one thing they wanted to learn about, we would hire an instructor just for that one person. I realized that probably in, in you know, casting a net for students that we would get students that expected that traditional kind of curriculum driven education. And I think it was a blow to them that we didn't even care if they came to classes. So my advice was, listen, you're either at the wrong place, you have to think about that, maybe, you know, go to university and get a you know traditional kind of degree or if you, you you just can't think of anything I'll make a list of things you might you might be attractive to you that you might explore there is an ethical point there for me giving advice to artists and why I would do that um, it just seemed like I had such a I had the worst art education ever a lot of things I uh, just thought were, I learned were bogus and it didn't, I didn't need to know. And, and there were a lot of things I needed to know that I didn't know. <laughs> but here I, I, I just thought I could speed up young artists becoming artists by giving them advice of things I had to learn the hard way. And I remember a student came up to me and say, why is it that what I read when a writer writes about an artist and what an artist says about themselves is always different. I'm amused that anybody would find that interesting, uh, but I think artists, I mean, other artists like to hear or read what's on another artist's mind. I was writing uh, uh, about my work for the gallery I, in which I was showing, so they would know why I did the work. I was accused by somebody, uh, one of the women that worked there at the desk, uh, that I was the only artist that used titles on their works. Not only that, but I wanted them on the wall next to the work. 
I, 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 again, I want it to be user friendly, making it easier by using t uh, text and imagery. That was the initial idea, but then I found out that you know it wasn't easy, <laughs> and I, I liked the idea of something looking deceptively simple, but, but then I try to make it difficult. Why do those letters mean anything at all? <laughs> you know, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with meaning, why things mean. I remember you know, sitting in the National City Library and reading plays. Again, I think the economy of the language. I would want to write something that's uh, both a play and a novel and a film script. I like film scripts because it talks about where people should be standing and where they come in, where they exit, and close up or wide shot. All those things really attract me, but I, I can never just do one thing. So I, I said, well, maybe I can do something that's all three things. I read a lot back then and more time. I saw a book of William Carlos Williams Holmes in a bookstore, and it was probably titled The Red Wheelbarrow and Other Poems. And I said, you know, that sounds pretty cool, you know, and so I picked it up and then I just love the simplicity of his language. Um, and so I bought it. And it, it became one of my favorite books. It didn't seem pretentious. And, you know, it didn't seem, you know, anything transcendental. It's just like, you know, every everyday stuff. Another reason too, I identified with him and then uh, maybe a little later, uh, Wallace Stevens, uh, that they both had day jobs. I thought, cool, you can be, have a job and also be an artist, and I could identify with that. Raymond Carver, too, he was an early discovery of mine. Again, the simplicity of the language, just about ordinary stuff. And I love the a poem he wrote called Bl Blood. And I was dealing with images of nosebleeds at the time. And I asked him if I could use that, you know, and he, he loved it. And that was probably my first illustrated poem. What appeals to me about poetry and songwriters, uh, I guess in, in, my, in my mind they're, they're quite similar. And uh, uh, I think it's, you know, basically the through line is the co economy of language. Sometimes they have to invent words. I think that's kind of cool just to make it fit into the, into the mold. Songs are not just spoken poetry, but sung poetry. I love the idea of trying to fit lyrics to a melody or in vice versa, a melody to lyrics. And I said, well, that's what artists have to do. You know, I have to do anyway, fit an image to some words or words to an image and trying to get the proper balance. So these are the words of John on his words. Um, and uh, in some kind of way, we felt, uh, Meg and I, it actually all started at the moment uh, when we were teaching at Otis, and uh, there was a seminar I was supposed to do, which, um, uh, and obviously Meg had been teaching there for a long time, and we somehow uh, started to talk about this whole aspect of John Balisari's words, and that how necessary it would be to give Balisari's corpus of writings actually an autonomy from his visual art practice. Because obviously, as you all know, words play a very important role in his practice as a visual artist. And uh, basically, very much from the beginning, word and image, uh, already before he actually got involved with conceptual art in the 60s, played a very big role. It's always been about an interplay, but the work is at the crossroads of the visual and the textures. It explores uh, this interplay of text and image asking very much what's the third, the fourth, the fifth meaning, which might actually emerge from the marriage uh, of the two. And in some kind of way, even when Balisari only presents images or only presents text, there is always a, a narrative uh, possibility. However, there has never been a book or a publication which would really look at his work you know, in terms of the autonomy of this text. And it seemed particularly urgent because actually when um, I asked John once about his unrealized project, he said that maybe his biggest unrealized project is to become a novelist. He wanted at the very beginning of his trajectory not to become a visual artist, but a novelist. And that's why we were very inspired somehow with this book to not just do, and I think that's the big difference to other kind of collected writing books which are out there, and also other kind of collected writing books you know, we've been involved previously in editing, 
is that it really doesn't appear to be an artist collected writing books with comparative illustrations and so on, but it is very much a book of text, which could be the book by somebody from the literary field. And that was somehow in dialogue also with Lionel what we wanted to achieve with this book. Now, obviously, um, uh, somehow it's not the daily practice for John Balesari. To make art is certainly you know, a much more frequent practice. To write happens every now and then. He actually told us that maybe email is the only daily practice he has of writing. Um, but, you know, very often there is an occasion, there is a, a trigger, for example, you know, his idea of writing on other artists, very much artists who, whom he finds inspiring. There is the text on Bruce Nauman, on Klaas Oldenburg, on Andy Warhol, but then also, very importantly, texts for younger artists. I mean, John's visionary activity as a as a teacher, he has letters of recommendations for his students, and you will find in the book many letters of recommendations for artists such as David Sally, Jack Goldstein, Mike Kelly, Tony Ursler. Then there are his notes and his memos, very often in his inimitable handwriting, and I think that's also a very important part, because we live in a moment where handwriting is endangered. Uh, as Umberto Eco pointed out in his uh, sort of manifesto type, text is that actually handwriting in the digital age is about to disappear. Teenagers very often don't really use handwriting now anymore, and it's fascinating to see um, John's really inimitable handwriting, particularly in his, in his notes, but also in his lists. It's interesting that one very peculiar category in the text are these lists. They're almost Olympian lists, kind of reminding us of Georges Perec, and as Meg always says, the, the interest of John in this list comes from his uh, idea that they are actually democratic and they're also an, an, a non-hierarchical, anti-hierarchical way of presenting uh, ideas. What is also, we think, very fascinating about John's writings is that it's really a journey into his epiphanies. Uh, I mean, he is a serial inventor. There have been very few artists in the last hundred years who have uh, invented so many different things, and he now, uh, still at this very moment in time, whilst he's you know, today in his studio in LA, keeps inventing, keeps coming up with new series. We've just organized an exhibition, which I co-curated for the garage in Moscow, uh, of an entire body. I mean, he filled the entire museum in Russia just with works he had done over the last two years. So the serial invention you know, never stops. And this sort of whole body of collected writings is also a journey for you all uh, through the reading to actually discover the many epiphanies of the serial inventor that is John Balesari. One can actually find his first epiphany, which was that actually art can be useful, that art can indeed play a role in his student life. He was a very you know, young artist and, and, and realized that actually art can be useful to the world. His second epiphany still during his early years in National City in the Santiago suburbs, was actually that he witnessed the failure of abstract painting and wanted to connect with ordinary viewers. It's what Gilbert and George call art for all. He wanted to speak, the work to speak to the people. And that idea you know, of speaking to the people, this address, is something which is very, very present in the text. A third kind of epiphany, and it's, you know, we cannot mention them all here. We would still be here at midnight because there are so many epiphanies John has. So I'm going to just select a few. Uh, a next epiphany is actually this idea that he decided to combine text and photography. I mean, that's something when you walk through the fair, which seems quite, you know, normal now. So many artists are doing that. But, you know, at that time, in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, this was an absolutely unusual, you know, I would say revolutionary thing. He combined text and photography on canvas, and uh, um, then a the next epiphany um, was actually, uh, obviously, this idea of uh, somehow move against the photographs exclusion from the art gallery. The 14 Commission paintings, for example, were a reaction, uh, a response to Al Held's suggestion that conceptual art was just pointing at things. And that's obviously something which is interesting also. Many of these texts are a reaction for something or a reaction against something. You know, they're also very often, it can involve a protest, it can involve a letter, he writes to something, um, and so on. So many, many more epiphanies to the present day, because as I mentioned, John never stood still. It's, it's a, um, uh, a complete disguise somehow to John Baldessari, the collected writings. And we also believe that um, in some kind of way, it's a conversation. There is a very conversational mode in this text. Baldessari told me the very first time we met, I was still a student in the 90s, he told me that, Art is always a conversation. It's always about this anticipation of a response. And obviously, um, that leads us also this sort of idea of a response to his very early epiphany that he wanted to avoid elitism, that he wanted to actually avoid any indifference towards the viewer. 
and have actually avoid any indifference towards the audience more generally. And that's something which is very, very deeply embedded in uh, the text. And very much, Meg, and I hope that this book will continue the conversational ethos of its author and look at the seen and previously unseen and as well as also an extension of Palisari's own openness to new encounters and new thoughts. We believe, and I mean, it's not a coincidence that entire generations, there are five generations of artists who have been inspired by John Palisari. So we hope that this is also a toolbox, you see, for many, many artists to get inspired, to get ideas. You know, very much as Foucault said, you know, books can be toolboxes. And, uh, um, and we are very, very grateful for John to have agreed to this adventure. It's been an extraordinary adventure because the texts have been very much uh, widespread. They have been in his boxes, in his archives. They have been also in many group catalogs. It was interesting also for Meg and me to go through all the group catalogs, the Documenta catalogs, the Biennale catalogs. Very often artists are asked you know, to deliver a statement and these statements are then dispersed and you just never see them you know, together. And we had this desire to somehow uh, gather it all together. And I think there is a great optimism also in the world of John Balesari, and it's actually all about the future. So I'd like to conclude with uh, John Balesari's own words when he talks about the future. He says the future will be tense and you know, we hope that the book is tense. Meg. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go back to the, the what the book where where the book really I think started um, with John saying that uh, he thinks of himself as a writer and his decision to use text. Well, why would he say that? Why did artists start to use text? And this might be a controversial point of view, but I think it's a moral position that somehow. Artists in the <clears throat> late 50s and 60s saw that images were corrupt. Images were the things that manipulated people. Images were about beauty. And this was the art world that they had a political position against. John would never use the word political. He would use the word moral. I do think that the decision to use writing or to think of himself as a writer, that somehow writers were less of tricksters than artists. They were, it was less about beauty, less about um, sensuality, and more about straight information. Over and over again, you'll hear Don, John talk about his work, especially his early work, of being, you know, no bullshit, just the information. And this is, in my understanding a kind of moral position and almost to me conceptual art has a kind of protestantism in it right no smells no bells no of this stuff you know no paintings just the text so in this i'm going to read a a, a, a an early piece that john wrote and it's an apology that he wrote to his um <clears throat> to his aunt cora who was the uh, the aunt of his uh, first wife, or his only wife, his ex-wife. <laughs> uh, so it's called Real Painting for Aunt Cora. So at this point, John is, um, yes, he's, he's painting, and he's starting to move away, actually, away from painting. And, he's, and Aunt Cora liked old-fashioned paintings, regular old paintings. So he writes this to her. I want to make a painting on black velvet or palm bark, not one of those modern art paintings of, he wants to make a painting of, glint on waves, pink clouds, sagebrush, squint-eyed tigers, flower carts, washing on line, bullfighters, bulls, sand dunes, red farmhouse, lady in a gypsy costume, ducks by an old well, oaken buckets, the USS Missouri, a panther with red beady eyes, a sad doggy, a Mexican cart, a burrow, a Mexican asleep under a cactus, a eucalyptus tree with leaves that look real, highlights on raven black hair, and all the world's a stage clown, dancing hot and tots with sunset, dewy roses, sleepy lagoons. But I can't. For me, this is quite a profound piece. He's saying, I can't do that. I'm, it's morally corrupt 
to do those things. So there is a, a, quite a bit in his writing, and John you know, says it in, this, in the video, that he, be, he writes for a purpose. There's, there's something... Well, in the book he says someone told him that in artworks he could tell stories like Jesus. And he thought that was a good idea. Right? So we have in, in the writings and in the, in the visual work a lot of stories and their moral lessons, particularly for young artists. So he gives uh, lots of advice here. And as he says in the video, John had no, you know, living in National City, which if you don't know is on the Mexican border, which is, you know, a kind of um, ghetto. Uh, he had no access to uh, sophisticated information except what he could get through the through the mail and really struggled to develop as a young artist. So he really wanted to, to uh, prevent that from happening to anyone else. So in the book, there's lots of advice to young artists. Are there any artists here? I'm so glad to see artists here. Um, I'm an artist. Uh, <clears throat> so, you know, here he is. He's got some, just some really pra practical advice. Like he says, on painting, tackiness. He says, to remove tacky surface feeling on your painting, simply wash the surface with water. I wouldn't have thought of that. Um, <clears throat> and this is my favorite line, actually. This is my favorite line in the whole book. This is the best advice that, in my view, Baldessari gives to artists. You should write this down. Whatever you decide to do, remember to keep it simple, keep it fresh, and have some idea of what you are going to do. And that segues to his, his philosophy, which he sells elsewhere in the book. There are three tenets to the Baldessari philosophy. They are simplify, simplify, simplify. He's very American in that. And so the simpler, the better. And the artists, the writers that he admires... William Carlos Williams, um, who he mentions, also have that, carry with it, that same aesthetic. And again, I, I'm going to argue that it's, it is a moral position. And he says in the, in the video, you know, somehow a serif on a letter is gratuitous. That's frivolous. Right? So, you know, all the conceptual artists use Helvetica. It's a moral position. It's a graphic moral position. And you see it even in in John's handwriting, in my hotel room, there's a early ver well, there's the his famous piece. Uh, I will not make any more boring art. And I I called John, you know, yesterday, and I said, John, you know, that's it's in my hotel room. He goes, Oh, look at my handwriting. And I said, What do you mean? He said, Well, I wrote it in cursive. He goes, Isn't it terrible? <laughs> and he goes, After that, I only printed, because you know somehow cursive was too fancy, right? He said, then I realized that just for the information, I'm going to get rid of the cursive. <laughs> and he was very serious. He said, it's, it, it's just terrible. I can hardly look at it. Because it, to him, it was too much like a painting or, you know, too fanciful. It was, it, you were seeing the brushwork, right? Now people kind of fetishize his printing, as we did it kind of in this video, right? We see him writing these lists. Uh, so what else do I have to say? So my view on John's writing, um, and maybe on John himself, that he, you know, he, 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 had, he decided between two occupations. He was either going to be a minister or an artist. And somehow he kind of ended up both. His belief is that, that writing should be useful his own writing and have a, have a purpose and to be easy, easily understood. He felt the writing that influenced him were not only the poets and things that we mentioned, but also things like the phone book uh, and simple signs. In my view, this is a very deep philosophical position that somehow art is a deceiver. And John doesn't want it to deceive. He wants it to reveal the most important thing to him, and I'm speaking for him because he's not here, <laughs> is for it to communicate in the simplest possible terms. So I'll end on that. So simplify, simplify, simplify. The book is easy to read for that reason. Uh, so, and I hope you enjoy it.
it's interesting also, Mech, that you, you, know, you mentioned literature, you have Carlos Williams and so on, because I think one of the things which is also fascinating is that from the origin, John you know, wanted to be a novelist and that as a visual artist, he never stopped having this dialogue with uh, literature. And I think in some kind of way, if we look at all the avant-garde of the 20th century, the historic avant-garde, the new avant-garde of the 60s, there has always been this bridge uh, between art and literature. And in some kind of way, I think in the current world, it's, it's not that it's gone missing, but as Sai Twombly always said, you know, it's not present enough. And I think it's very fascinating to talk to John about literature. He sees his writings, uh, but also his films and his, his, his artworks in a connection to many writers, to Sylvia Plath, to, to Marcel Proust, to Tristram Shandy by Laurence Stern. It's interesting that um, uh, he once told me that he has a habit that he develops, which is reading about people that were involved in a creative task other than art. He would spend a lot of time reading about writers because for the most part they seem to have the same kinds of problems as visual artists. But he thinks at the same time being able to look at what artists do through the activity of another person is a way to think more clearly about it and the problems that are faced. The last animal to criticize salt water would be a shark. If you're immersed in it, you don't see it. But if you can get into some other area, then you can see more clearly. No? And I think that sort of idea of uh, literature um, uh, leads also to you know, many of, of his book projects. For example, John illustrated Tristram Shandy by, by Lawrence Stern, and he was approached by a publisher, and the idea was actually um, to, to, uh, for artists to illustrate books. And he chose, John chose two, two of his favorite books, the Tristram Shandy by Lawrence Stern and Don Quixote. And um, the Lawrence Stern was realized because he really thinks that um, Tristram Shandy is kind of like a double, a doppelganger of, of his own. He, he, he uh, loves this non-linear element and also the tendency towards uh, digression, which you have in Lawrence Stern, which you have in all of John's art. And uh, he thinks it's, it feels like, like him. And this marvelous book was born, no? where basically John would illustrate Tristram Shandy. And it's something which doesn't exist enough today. I mean, if you look at you know, earlier historic avant-garde, I mean, it's interesting to see here you know, this uh, collection there is in Miami, this quite amazing collection of poetry, which is in the new Herzog de Meron Museum. It's a, a fascinating room. It's a, a collector, uh, a couple who had just collected poetry and art, uh, rare books over many, many years, and it's installed in a room in the Herzog de Meron building. And you can see there are many, many of these bridges, you know, from Apollinaire uh, to Fluxus. Uh, and, and in some kind of way, I think that bridge, you know, to literature, I mean, uh, Meg, you mentioned William Carlos Williams, is a, and also John has mentioned ever since I visited him, almost in, in, every, in every visit, he's a great influence on him in terms of what you described, this utter simplicity. He always said that this utter simplicity actually comes from William Carlos Williams, uh, that actually columns or writing can be so simple and so transparent and yet so powerful. Uh, and it's this kind of quality which I think he's looking for, and that's something you can also see in another visual artist John admires, which is Henri Matisse. I mean, it's very interesting that in the exhibition we did in Moscow, with his recent work, John pays homage to, to artists from the past. He shows us that very often the future is invented with fragments from the past. And there are lots of references there to Matisse and this incredible simplicity of Matisse works. Know that Matisse works can look so simple, but yet at the same time they are so profound leads us back to William Carlos Williams, who, for, for John, as he told me, was a person who seemed to be a model uh, in terms of what he could do with words. And uh, John said he always wanted to give the same kind of power and simplicity uh, that you know, Williams achieved with, uh, with his words. So that sort of whole idea of a bridge between art and literature is important. And obviously, another bridge is the, is the link to the Ulipo movement, which Meg and I discussed a lot, because there are these lists uh, in the book. And uh, it's really very impressive how John uses lists as a kind of a medium. And um, I just wanted to read you a, a short fragment of my favorite text in the book, which is a list of art ideas for the first class of CalArts Post Studio if they have no ideas of their own from which to make a piece. Uh, and it's too long to read you the whole thing because it's dozens and dozens. It's actually 109 points. It's 109. I'll just say one, one thing about that. That So we talked about this. Um, I, I explained to Hans Ulrich that in America we call this these things that we give students handouts, right? The, the professor writes these handouts. And um, 
it's a whole category of artist writing, especially in Los Angeles. There are lots of um, pretty well-known uh, artists are teaching. And so they've done all these lectures and all these handouts, but who's collected them? So this is, we have quite a few handouts in here, and I like that term, and it's very much about John's writing, that, you know, he writes it in order to give it to someone so that they can make it, so they can make use of it. So we'll just read an excerpt from it. Homage to handouts. Um, Imite Palisari, number one, Imite Palisari in actions and speech, video. Number two, make up an art game. Structure a set of rules with which to play. A physical game is not necessary. More important are the rules and their structure. Do we in life operate by rules? Does all art or art rules like tenant rules or art violations? Number three, how can we prevent art boredom? Number four, write a list of art lies untruths that might be truthful if you really thought about them. However, consider this. Art truths that we hear often are boring in their correctness. Number five. How can plants be used in art? Problem becomes how can we really get people to look freshly at plants as if they've never noticed them before? A few possibilities. Arrange them alphabetically like books on a shelf. Plant them like popsicle trees, as in child art, perpendicular to line of hill. Include object among plants that is camouflaged. Color a palm tree pink. Photo found growing arrangements. Or a movie on how to plant a plant. Number six. How can gallery use be subverted, as in land art? Exchange locations with another business. Photo gallery square feet for square feet and paste up in another space. One way glass in front of gallery. Number seven, give police artist verbal description of Baldessari and have him do drawing. Perhaps everyone in class does verbal description. Number that, eight. that one was actually made. Was done. That one was done. Some of these were done either by John or by um, artists, and we could mention the artists that borrowed these ideas, or maybe we shouldn't, but um, <laughs> you'd be surprised at the artists that read this list and made works. Maybe some of the last one. 108, photograph of umbrella and sewing machine on an operating table. That's a realism, isn't it? <laughs> and then last but not least, 109, blow powdered color through straw on drawing made with fat on wall underground. That's cave art, isn't it? And in this list, there's the one, there's the punishment piece. He says, I will make, do a punishment piece that says, I will not make any more art, or I will not make any more boring art. So then no one used that idea, so he used it himself. Do you have more text, Mac, you want to read, or shall we open it for questions? I think we should open it for questions, yes. Any questions? Hi. Um, I just have a question because when we talk about artists like John Baldessari and artists from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, we always talk about them in like the past tense. And these artists are still kind of making work today. I was just wondering if you could comment on them. What is it like for them to still make work? And how are we as consumers supposed to kind of still digest this new work that they make? Are we still supposed to, supposed to think of it in the context of a kind of contemporary art today? Or are we supposed to think of it as uh, in the context of their work from the 50s and 60s? How, what is the relationship? How do the, why do they still need to make art in a way? That's an excellent question. Um, you know, why, why does someone who's had some level of success and why do they keep doing it? Is that the question? Part of it? Part of the question? I'm sorry, I can't, I can't hear you, but... No. I think, um, again, I'm, you know, imagining how John would answer this. I, 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 
he talks about that there was a point in his career where it was forbidden to wear your heart on your sleeve, right? That, you know, if, if someone were to say that, and, and that actually, I, this might be a misquote, that, that uh, Robert Smithson uh, would accuse artists of wearing their heart on their sleeve, and they knew that, you know, you didn't want Bob Smithson to say that about you, right? So you wouldn't want to reveal any, you know, anything emotional. Expressionism was the, the worst possible uh, criticism, that you were an expressionist. I think in John's case, he got to a certain age and he just said, fuck it, you know, I just do what I want. Um, so, you know, you will see uh, more, uh, some works that would, are almost sentimental, but he wouldn't have allowed himself. And, it, and you see that with many artists, uh, in, you know, at, 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 as they get older, um, I don't know, but it's like all those paintings David Hockney did of his dogs, you know, they're so cute, right? I mean, he might not have started with those, right? It, 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 too, too sensitive, I suppose. Um, yeah. But there was another part of your question that I'm missing. Uh, I don't, I don't remember, but I mean, I'm just interested in this kind of like limbo that a lot of a lot of older artists get into, where. Um, I'm not sure why I should be kind of um, looking at this art anymore. Oh, why should you care? Yeah, that, that's I a guess good so. question. And I do care. I mean, I, I love his work, but I still feel like I, I look at his new work in the context of his, his old work. I don't compare. Uh, well, think I, have about two, it I have two points way. about that. One is that, um, well, I, I, I teach artists and I am an artist. And, um, getting past the 70s is hard. You know, I mean, when people said art ended in the 70s, you got to take that. You really got to think about that. I have to think about that. You know, and, I, and we've seen a rehashing of the 70s. That list that Hans Ulrich just read, a lot of those strategies you could see, you're going to be able to see outside here. Right. So there's still it, 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 it's still seen as the, you know, pure time. Right. That, uh, that we couldn't get we couldn't get past. Um, in John's case, I think he tries to keep it lively by doing things, new things. Uh, he recently did a, a body of work where he took lyrics from uh, Tom Waits songs. Uh, it's not in the video, but he said it on camera that he really relates to Tom Waits because they're from the same town. Uh, Tom Waits worked in John's father's pizza parlor. And uh, he sees Tom Waits' music to be all about National City and that in some way, his work is really about National City, which is an, a perspective I hadn't heard before. Um, so that would be an example of him doing something that he might not have early, early on. He might not have used song lyrics uh, and, and now is. Yeah, and also, you know, I think, I mean, it's an interesting question because we've been asking ourselves that with Kate Fowle when we did, you know, this exhibition in, in, in Moscow, all of his, you know, recent work. And in some kind of way, it grew very much out of this amazing retrospective Jessica Morgan had curated. Uh, um, it's a traveling retrospective. And uh, a truly you know, amazing experience to see all of this work of John of the, of the last decades you know, together. Um, however, you know, I felt seeing this retrospective and then you know, working on the book, visiting him regularly, and seeing the amazing work he does now, he said almost like after this retrospective, it felt very urgent that there is a very, very big show of what he's doing now. And I don't think at all that he's an old artist. I think you, know, you cannot apply this. I think in art, you know, age is relative. And for me, John Baldessari is you know, one of the youngest artists I know. And he does, his work has an incredible presence and an incredible freshness. And it's, it's, it's this principle of never stopping. He's never stopped. I mean, he's never stopped inventing. He's never stopped. Uh, you know, it's not. And I think that's the thing in terms of, uh, you know, of uh, what is so great about art is that it can it can continue forever. And you know, I've, uh, Rosemary Tocco a couple of years ago thought that it would be a good idea for me to visit uh, very old artists, much much older than, than than John. You know, artists who are 100 years old, whose eyes are a century. So you know, I visited many, many artists all over the world who are 100 years old. And I think, you know, it would be difficult in other professions to, to find artists, you know, to find practitioners who at 100 years, you know, are young. And that's the thing about art, that it just never, that it just never stops. It's something which goes on as long as life goes on. Yeah, it would, it would be a huge mistake to define an artist like Philip Gustin by his early work, you know, um, right?
I had a question about your recent conversation with uh, John on this idea that the piece I will not make boring art really should have been printed instead of cursive because when I see that piece, the fun of it or the trick of it is the idea that you know this is a class assignment and you have to write that in perfect cursive. And I'm wondering if you think that that feels too gimmicky to him now and that the, the clear communication of print uh, is a stronger idea or more important to him. And as a follow-up, what's his approach to, to typeface and, and how, how does he think about that um, in the conversations you've had with him? Um, well, one, he, he's embarrassed that his uh, cursive is not very nice and that he couldn't write in a straight line. Uh, that's what he said. But I think there's more to it than that. I think that um, handwriting is more expressive than if it were printed, right, or done by a sign painter. So there was a point in his early work, John's early work, where he began to use a sign painter. Um, and, in fact, he and I are curating a show with the Santa Monica Museum of the sign painter that everybody in LA uses um, because we all have the same idea that our own handwriting is too gestural, right? Too expressive. So we only use the handwriting of this guy named Norm. And uh, it, you'd be astonished of how many artists handwriting is actually Norm's handwriting. Um, so it's, it's a secret history of art. Um, and you'll see that the, the the question about the typeface is really important. You know, um, Michael Asher would obsess, on, or Steve Prino, or people like obs absolutely obsess on the typeface and and the meaning of the typeface because they denied themselves everything else. Right? They they said, okay, we, we've gotten rid of color, motif, uh, theme, all these things. So now all I've got is type on a on a piece of paper. But then in a way, they get expressionistic about that, right? That this, this type is plainer, more sincere, uh, less gimmicky, right? Usually no serif, right? This, it, there's a political point there. The serif has a, is, uh, is politicized. I think, as far as I understand, uh, we are running out of time. Uh, but I'm extremely grateful to all of you for being here. As always, we are grateful to the wonderful Claudio Vogt for the great uh, organization. And Meg and I, of course, are ever grateful uh, to John uh, for everything. Thank you so much. Thank you.